Oh yeah, for many years, many, many years. We worked very, very closely together. We traveled a lot together and I worked and lived on the Bowery as well, actually in the, my wife and I is also here, lived on the, uh, we lived on the Bowery in the, yeah, where she was calling it kind of ground central there. That's where we lived. So how did that meeting come about? Where, where was I was organising an, ex- an exhibition by the uh, British artist Jamie Reid, actually. Did all the work for Sex Pistols and so on. And um, somebody who worked with Nan looked after this space we were using, and that's how, that's how I met her. But we hit it off very quickly. I don't really know how, because I'm just a kind of kid from Bromley, really. And uh, somehow, very quickly, we found ourselves right in the middle of a most extraordinary situation. And uh, from that point on, it was really a question of holding on for dear life. And was that in the UK that you met? No, in New York. It was in New York. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you were there at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you were there as an artist, a curator? Well, I, I found myself working as Nan's studio manager for a long, long time. A friend, assisting, you know, curating shows with her, organising stuff, enabler, Ugh, bear wrangler everything you know all the time it was a it was a very intense job and at the time it was often as you could probably imagine extremely challenging but in retrospect it was an extraordinary life experience really you say at the time when was that from the late 90s through to the early 2000s that kind of right. era or mid 2000s that sort of time so speaking of uh, Nan at the time, mm. could you tell us a bit more about where she was at in her campaign work? What stage was she at? at well, she time? wasn't doing any campaign work then. She right. she was she spoke often about the Witnesses Against Our Vanishing show that she'd done. That was very important to her, and her connection with ACT UP was something that had, had been very important. Mm. Um, but at that point, when I was working with her, we were really doing exhibitions, big major exhibitions in big institutions worldwide. And then working on Sister Saints and Sibyls, which is shown here. So, I mean, that was harrowing, I have to say. What was your role in that project? I produced it. You produced it? Yeah. Right, yeah. and you were still in New York at the time, yeah. presumably. Yeah, I think I was the US producer. We had somebody in Paris helping out there too, as well. So. so, speaking of as someone who's known her over the years, mm. I was quite curious to see from a personal point of view... In what ways you f- you might have seen um, her own photography, her own art, potentially being affected by her campaign work? If I'm honest, I'd say yeah. no. Um, because in you know since I ceased working with Anna, which I think was 2006, she carried on working. But I, I think she was probably looking for something. And. I think she was en route to Mexico City, I think it was, and read this article in The New Yorker, uh, having had these problems herself with OxyContin, Mm -hmm. read the article, and and suddenly this is something that she can really focus her extreme energy on. She's a very powerful person, unbelievably powerful, and um, very intelligent, witty, all the stuff that comes across in the film, really. And, uh, boy, she really threw herself at that campaign and she's done an incredible she's done incredible things I think we can all agree that yeah. damn it I mean she's disappointed at this point that she that it's still not over mm-hmm. and there's so much to be done but she's achieved so much I mean I'm, I have to say just personally speaking I'm incredibly proud of her I really am I had another question slightly less um less aesthetic in nature mm. but I had a query about uh her campaign work mm. and And there's a lot of it that's addressed in the film, but I wanted to know about you, your perspective on it. How the campaign, her specific campaigning work, how did that affect, not her art this time, but her reputation as an artist? or Did it just overshadow her her reputation as a photographer? Well, as it says in in the film, she she had so much leverage Hmm. um, with these institutions that it was possible to, you know, to have that fight as it were, like with uh, the National Portrait Portrait Gallery here with Nick Cullinan, to say, look, I'm going to withdraw myself from this exhibition that, we, that we're planning unless you take the money away, take the blood money away. And he listened, you know, and good for him. Yeah, he kind of, he listened. So she has immense leverage with with these institutions. So can I, I'd like to point one thing out while I've got an opportunity actually as well, uh, related to all the Sackler 
campaign work that she's done. There's a word which occurs quite often in this film. I don't know if anybody else noticed the repetition of the word stigma. And it's something which uh, Nan has said that what she has wanted to what she wanted to do is remove the stigma from opioid problems and take that stigma and stick it on the Sackler family. And I think she's done an incredible thing here. Really, I mean, the film is made by Laura, and it's probably could be Laura that actually stands up with the Oscar or the BAFTA in a couple of weeks here. But really, it's Nan's film. It's all Nan's work, really. I mean, Laura's done a great job of putting it all together, but damn, it should be Nan that's going to be picking up that Oscar. It really should be. So Yeah, well, well speaking of which, actually, she certainly did shine uh, the spotlight onto Sackler. Um, now, I, I knew at least the basics of the Sackler story and the and the opioid crisis. Um, but I'm curious to see how widely that is known. So in the room, just out of curiosity, if you can put your hand up, if you knew about Sackler and about what they had done. Okay, so <laughs> preaching to the converted. So a fair few of you. Um, quite recently from the film Dopeset, in fact. That's ah, interesting, right. okay. Yeah, I think because of publicity. <laughs> But th this film has had an extraordinary publicity, hasn't it? It's oh, been extraordinary. I mean, I was on the coming back from London a couple of days ago, and there's a guy flicking through the Evening Standard, and suddenly there's Nan in there again, and he's like looking at going like this, and I'm, I think I said, to him, "I've got to get that off you. I'm sorry." <laughs> I've got to. So we eventually kind of tore out the necessary pages, and I shot them and sent them off to Nan here to say, "Look, you're ev absolutely everywhere, everywhere. You know, it's on all the newspapers, front row, everything here. So really." the amount of information that people have, have have been putting in front of them even just through yeah. news reporting is i think it's tremendous i really think it's tremendous it's really shone a light on an evil family an evil empire of drug dealers mm -hmm. who really have absolutely no shame whatsoever in what they've done i mean the whole company was set up from the beginning with evil intent it really was the marketing from day one was always about getting to the doctors, making sure they prescribed their products. Sack, uh, well, Purdue, which was, well, whoever, yes. Purdue uh, paid the software company that provided software, software to doctors in America to make sure that OxyContin was at the top of the list of possible prescriptions. You know, it's despicable. It's absolutely cynical and despicable. The Contin bit of the name on OxyContin refers to the continuity. The drug was supposed to be effective for 12 hours. One dose, 12 hours. No. It's actually only effective for eight hours. So it's actually an answer in here from dose one. After eight hours, you're in trouble. That is despicable. But they knew that. They knew exactly what they were doing. So they were building in this, this urgency and this need for more all the time. Yeah. And what's mad is that they operate so openly like a mafia, mm. really. Mm. Um, there's no sort of even the veneer of... <laughs> I'm thinking of the energy companies these days. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're operating within the remit of capitalism, yeah. so this is just what we do. Yeah. This is even a step beyond that, yeah. where it's just extortion really, yeah. and, and bribery. I'd like to actually just give a shout out. Uh, when we did the action at the VNA, mm -hmm. we ha also had along uh, BP or not BP and Cultural Unstained. They came along as well to lend their support to it, you know, because they also understood that this is a broad fight. And it goes on. Well, well, I was going to ask that. So you've taken active part in the action as well. Yeah. Where are we at now, in your opinion? Well, after this screening, we're all going to get up <laughs> and we're going to go to Oxford because Oxford still carry the Sackler name. Uh, yeah. So it goes on. And the yeah. There you go. And the, sorry? Ashmolean. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're doing that. In a minute, I think. Saturday night. Is that all right? Yeah. Ah, it's a detour. But also, the FDA have yeah. a lot to answer for as well. Of course they do, yeah. Because they allowed this 
to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, most doctors knew that taking opioids, it's, they, they couldn't really understand it, but they hold on, it's been, you know, the FDA say it's okay, and yeah. you know, it's yeah. such a good campaign, campaign they had. Well, they were also getting paid. Yeah, mm-hmm. every level. You know, the, the, and I saw this firsthand, you know, doctors prescribing things that really shouldn't be prescribed because there's money in it for them. Yeah, they, get, they do well. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to point out, yeah, if I may, sorry, that the other um, uh, focus for pain is now setting up OPCs or overdose prevention centres as well. Mm-hmm. So there's places for clean drug usage, which are like there's one in New York that saved something like 600 lives in the first two or three months of opening, which is incredible. So I think there's two in New York now. There's one open in San Fran, another one in Rhode Island, I think. So it's a clean space. You know, everything's monitored very carefully. No stigma, again. Yeah. And saving lives. Yeah. Uh, speaking of pain, can you tell us a little bit more about um, logistically how it operates? Because... because <laughs> Clearly, there's an international scope to... to well, increasingly crisis. so as well. I mean, uh, the Purdy Pharma, mm-hmm. although no, they're now being uh, turned into a publicly owned company, their attention is shifting very subtly. They're uh, involved with a company here in the UK called Naps. They also have another company called uh, Mundi Pharma, which sounds very benign, doesn't it? Mm. But because they're obviously thinking, it's a bit like the cigarette companies... When they have uh, uh, too much legislation in zone A, they just shift their attention to zone B mm-hmm. and it carries on because they can carry on making money. It's huge markets for them out there. Mm. Yeah. So just the USA is not nearly enough for them. Well, let's yeah. hope that enough people see this film. If nothing else, it's raising awareness. I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight. Big round of applause for John. Thank um, you. For coming